Hey there, welcome to my channel. I'm Daniel. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about hex crawls today. Hex crawl is kind of the general term where you've got a group of adventurers that are just kind of traveling about the land. It's usually, I mean, I guess anytime you're doing that, even if it's a set goal, uh, it would still be a hex crawl, but usually people use it in more of a, like a sandbox type situation where the players are allowed to kind of go wherever they want. Um, and I was actually going to write, uh, uh, do a video today about kind of just writing an adventure from a story that you read. But then last night I got a comment on a video about a campaign I did a few years back. Uh, I guess I was just looking at it now and they asked like how I did it or was it from a module. And uh, it was a hex crawl and it was random. And I thought, well, it was also based on a story. So I, I had been reading uh, The Dying Earth by Jack Vance and uh, The Eyes of the Overworld in particular. I'll put a link to the video. Uh, video it's a series, so the link to the videos, I guess, if you guys want to watch those live plays. Anyways, uh, in the story, um, the protagonist gets gets caught trying to steal from a wizard. They get dropped on the other side of the world to p pick up a magic item, and they have to bring it back. It's like a, they're going to die if they don't. I don't want to get too much into it, but essentially, though, the whole book is the adventures of this protagonist getting back to where they started, the traveling o over the land, and everywhere they go is like completely weird and random. And I mean, Va Vance does an amazing job with this kind of stuff. You know, I, I started playing D&D &D when I was a kid, and about nine years old, and I've said that before, and we, we taught ourselves to pre play, and we created adventures based on the stuff we saw, you know, cartoons or whatever, or movies. But I never read Vance until recently, and man, I wish I had. If you've never read Jack Vance, I recommend it, um, you know, especially the Dying Earth stuff, because it very much is D&D, &D, you know, in my mind. It's like exactly the way that um, I, when you look at that, and then you look at the rules and how things work, D&D it, it, &D makes a lot more sense. In any case, um, that particular thing... What I did was I used a lot of randomization because of the story. Every place that the the, the let's say the protagonist went was completely bizarre. Um, I wanted to use something like really random and bizarre. And then at the same time, I was looking around. Um, I know they've got a lot of bad press lately, but at the time, you know, one of the the big um, people that was getting praised for their modules was Lamentations of the Flame Princess. But this particular module, which is uh, the Island of the Unknown was basically being panned as like terrible. Like it was like, this is a terrible module. It's not worth the money. Like, why are you wasting money on this? Like, it was just like, it was really, it got, it got shit on. So, you know, me always being wanting to take a challenge. I was like, let me pick it up and see what the deal is. <laughs> and it turns out this was good for me. This module is essentially an island. Island didn't known. It's a hex crawl and it doesn't really have a story behind it. And a lot of it is very random. I mean, some of the hexes are interconnected. But basically, there's a lot of random stuff. There's a lot of random uh, wizards. There's a lot of random uh, statues. And there's a lot of uh, random monsters. And then other just weirdness. So, like, I'll just, I'm going to look, like, it's, like, you can see the map here. I'm not going to get too much into the module because I only use it as a, as a baseline. But, like, I'll just give you an, an example. Uh, let's see. Hex uh, 1015. A statue of a barbarian is carved uh, from a brownish green rock that has a blue sheen in the sunlight. Its eyes are set uh, with wine red garnet crystals, worth 100 gold pieces each. If anyone attempts to take the garnets, the statue animates and attacks, and it gives stats for it. You know, classic, nothing to write home about. There's a lot of weird monsters in this, um, but what you have to understand, I guess, in something like this, right, is... And they say at the beginning, and, and, and people say it's kind of a cop-out, but... It's not meant to be an adventure. It's literally a place where you drop people and then you create adventures around it. That's just like one thing that's in that hex and the hex is big. So of course, if I just use all those encounters, it'd be boring and stupid. So I had a little bit of a framework. You know, I knew what I wanted to do and I wanted to then start to fill up these hexes. So what I did was I created a set of random tables that I could use while we were playing to keep everything so that wherever they went, I could create what was gonna happen. And it was randomized, but with a little bit of kind of control. So I'm going to show you my screen here. I'm going to show you the original document. And when we get through this, I may actually start making changes to it because I've, I've learned a bit, you know, I've, since I've done this. And uh, it, maybe we'll adjust it a bit. Oh, I, there's a couple of things I use, though, that I just want to talk about. This right here, uh, Fantasy's Gamer uh, Companion, this is by Game Science. I picked this up actually at Gen Con. <laughs> it's so old school looking. And uh, it's still in print. And actually, if you go to Game Science, uh, I'll put a link, but uh, and I'll show it in a second. It's like 11 bucks. It's got a lot of stuff in it, but there's a monster section. And again, the monster section is very vague in the way it's written, which I really like. Like, for instance, I'll just pick a monster right here. Uh, Dev, D-E-V. I don't know if that's... It tells you where it's from. Armenian, so it's got an, an Armenian uh, myth, I guess. One-eyed giants who live in forests and moors. A dev might have as many as seven heads. 
Those with two or more heads can throw rocks up to 100 yards with great accuracy. Like most giants, they are dumb. And that's all it says, right? It doesn't say anything else about them. There is like this little weird like universal stat thing in the back, but I didn't use it because I just made up my stats as I, when I needed them because Lamentations is very easy like that. So I used this to have weird monsters, right? I also used this, the Book of Imaginary Beings. If you don't have this, I recommend picking this up. You can probably, I get, I'll probably get this on Amazon. You can get this on Amazon or whatever. This book is like literally just a bunch of monsters and just like it's made to just be read. It's not a gaming book but at all. Um, so oh, here, here's fairies. The name of these creatures is linked to the Latin word ferum, meaning fate or destiny. With their magic, they intervene in the affairs of men. Some have said the fairies are most numerous, beautiful memorial of the minor deities. They are not limited to any one region or time. The ancient Greeks and Eskimos and ancient Indians uh, tell stories of heroes who have won the love of these fantastic creatures. Such adventures are dangerous, however, since once the fairy's passion is satisfied, they may kill their lover. In Ireland and Scotland, fairies are said to have underground dwellings uh, where they look upon men, women, and children. So, again, no game stats. This is literally just flavor, right? And it's giving you some feel. So if I want to encounter with fairies, fa fairies, fairies, that's my message text coming up. I got that. Okay, that's kind of the inspiration stuff, right? But what about the meat and potatoes of this thing? That's what we're going to get into right now. I'm going to show you one more thing on uh, physically because I don't have PDFs of them. This is um, from New Big Dragon Games, I think it's called. I'm gonna, again, I'm going to show it in a second. This is the D30 Sandbox Companion. He also makes a just D30 Companion that's got like dungeon dressing and stuff. But this one, like, uh, like for instance, you've got all these charts. And what we can do is we can roll and be like, okay... Uh, Inhabited by population density, and you roll. It might be like 19 to 20 people per, uh, that's a village, you know, roll on such such table. It's got a ruins generator, which I use, uh, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. And also a temple generator. It's really great. It also has random monsters, which I didn't really use because I used other things, but it's got all kinds of, you know, natural stuff. This is actually super useful. Um, all right, so let's get, I'm going to show you my screen now, and let's kind of get into this um, as we go here. Let's see, is my screen. Okay, boom, boom, boom. You guys probably saw a little like. All right, but right now I'm on New Big Dragon Games, New Big Dragon. Right, this is the thing I was just talking about the uh, the um, the D30 companion. So you can get this from him. Um, you can buy it on Drive Through RPG too. It's six bucks, or you get the print uh, for ten bucks, which is what I did. I don't think he had a, a PDF when I bought mine. And, you know, for this kind of stuff, anyways, I like to like sit down at my table and spread out all my books and roll them up. Like I don't usually use a PDF since I'm not using it in play. I would not recommend using this, but by the way, this is why I'm doing it this way. I wouldn't recommend like rolling through this book while you're live at the table with the players. It's a little bit time consuming to do that. It doesn't take that much time, but when players are staring at you, you don't want to roll six times to just say what the ruin looks like. So there's that. This is the Fantasy Gamers Companion, which I just showed you. It's 11 bucks from Game Science. You know, you can uh, you can have a chip to you. Again, there's no PDF of this as far as I know. So you got to get the fantasy, the actual book, which is fine uh, for me. And that's what I did. Actually, I, like I said, I bought it at Gen Con. But if you want to get another one. Also, they make great dice. So um, this is uh, just to show you, the, he's got a whole bunch of stuff on Drive Through RPG, New Big Dragon. So if you're interested in uh, his game master screen is, is super nice. I don't know. I guess that's a PDF of it. I don't know if I'd... It's useful, I guess, for the tables. Um, he has a physical game master screen, or he used to. So if you play BX, because most of his stuff's BX, it's a great screen. Um, he has a sandbox companion, which I should. Okay. So here's another resource that, that I use quite a bit, which is basically uh, Don John. If you haven't seen this, you should go there. D-O-N-J-O-N. This has got tons and tons of uh, stuff to generate if you want. You know, like I'm over here in the fantasy random generator, random location. I can do... Uh, you know, here's a ancient tomes, you know, and it gives you uh, information, uh, you know, about the about the books or whatever, if you want to add them in your book. I've used that when I make libraries. So this is really useful um, here. Towns and cities. So I hit, let's see, any size, let's just say any any, any size, any race, default culture, let's just boom, the first one. Heenham, population 27,000, mixed humans and other civilized races. 
The cities of Tangle have narrow streets and row buildings. Two factions struggle for control of the city, council of women, and a court of aristocrats. So this gives you that quick little thing. Because, you know, when you're doing a sandbox, one thing that you want to really keep in mind is that you don't want necessarily to have lots and lots of information about any one thing unless the players latch onto it. What you want is just enough flavor to get them interested. And then if they are and they stay there, then, you know, before the next session, you can keep working on it. But basically, that's enough to kind of explain what the city looks like. You can make up some random things off the top of your head if they start investigating. You don't have to go too far into it, right? Now, this is what I did, though. So we're looking at my screen. This is actually a, a pages document, like a Word document. And what I decided was, and I'll tell you, I actually changed this as we started playing. Or I'll tell you how I did it. So I decided that, no, I don't want to give a new version of OBS. No, thanks. Um, what we've got here is uh, I'm having a D8 three times per day, morning, noon, and night. So that's what I wrote down for myself. What I ended up doing was I rolled all three of them um, first thing in the morning. And then I looked at the encounters and I structured the day to make it more interesting. I felt like that was a better way to do it. Um, for me, it actually worked out pretty well. I think after the first session, I started doing it that way. So that's not a bad way to do it if you want things to actually make a little bit more sense and you can combine things. Also, I did not roll it like a lot of people were random encounters where it's like you roll a number and then you have an encounter. Otherwise, you see nothing. I wanted them to encounter something every single day. So there's no roll to see if they find something. There's they roll on this chart three times a day, and these are what they can find. If they roll a one or a two, uh, then you roll another d6. It's basically a monster. But if you roll a uh, a one or a two, you, they find a layer of a monster. Three or four, they find uh, them wandering. Or a five or six, they find just footprints and tracks. So they can make a decision, right? It's a decision point. If they see the lair, that doesn't mean they walked up on it necessarily. Like, oh my god, now we have to fight. The lair is going to probably have signs around. You're going to know, like you're going to see a beaver dam, or you're going to see caves where bears are, or whatever. If they're wandering, that's the most likelihood that they're going to actually encounter them in a fighting way. Um, so that that would happen. Uh, if the they, if the roll of the eight is a three, then they're going to run um, a trap or a hazard. These I just made up on the fly based on where they were. It's easy enough to do. Um, you know, sometimes I made them like actual traps. Like if I decided, like let's say that I had rolled uh, a monster earlier and it was centaurs and you were going to meet them randomly wandering and then I also rolled a trap, then what I might do is it might be the centaurs are going to trap them. You know, maybe they have uh, stuff out there hunting, right? This is why I say I rolled three together. It, it made it a lot easier for me. Um, but it could be anything. Difficult terrain, river crossings, cliff face, just or, or clues, right? So basically this was just stuff to, to add flavor. Uh, number four would be special. If they if I roll a four, then the keyed location in that hex, like the one I read, is what they find. Uh, number five is signs of destruction. I have a table below, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, weather event is six, and I had a random weather chart that I used. Uh, location table is, I made a table below, and pilgrim's table, which we'll talk about in a second. So let's go down to the tables now. So I roll three of these, and then I go down, and I have my locations. Table one. So let's say that they got a location. Uh, ancient and empty ruins. So no monster, just ruins, right? Uh, or ruins below. So you notice that ancient empty ruins, I don't, don't have a chart for. Because there's no monster there. I'm just going to make up whatever I think is fine. It's, it's easy enough to, on the fly to be like, oh yeah, you know, this was a blah, blah. You know, basically there's nothing there. It's a... Excuse me, I'm going to lose my voice here. They, that's just there for flavor. And, and again, another reason why I started mixing things together. Because maybe I'll have a weather event and they'll, it starts hailing. Oh, and you see off in the distance a, a, a ruined city. And I know it's empty, of course, but they don't. Do they want to charge into that city to get out of these hailstones and stop taking damage from it and risk that there's monsters in there or do that or, you know, whatever. So you can combine stuff. And that's kind of what I did there. Uh, if, they, if they get a ruins for table below or a temple, then I roll here or, or, or a special location. Uh, this, this here, this I got from the D30 book. So hut, slightly sunken, collapsed, crumbling, and covered. This is all stuff I got from the D30 book. I rolled it randomly, right? So they have three levels of monsters in a, in a, in a, in a ruin. Overrun, nuisance, and infested. So infested being the most, I believe, right? So basically nuisance means there's just a couple. Uh, overrun, there's a bunch. And infested means there's a lot of monsters there. So in this case, it's overrun with uh, cockatrice. 
So there's a lot of cockatrice in here. So they come in, they, they, you know, they, you see this crumbling hut. They, they might be gathered around. They might be inside. That will help me determine how many are going to be there. Again, it's vague uh, because I'm going to make it up or I'm going to roll randomly or, you know, once I get there. This is, this is why it works for the sandbox because if it doesn't make sense for there to be, you know, a ton of cockatrice here for whatever reason, then I can just make it one, you know. It's easy enough for me to change that by not having a fixed number there. Plus, hot, slightly sunken, collapsed, crumbling, and covered, I could describe that in 10 different ways, which means I don't need to keep recycling. I can recycle these without them really even realizing that I'm using the same chart. Um, small city, slightly crumbling, nuisance of humanoids, cyclopses, right? Uh, noticeably burned shrine infested with satyrs. Okay, so why are the satyrs infesting the shrine that is burnt? Did they burn it? Right, these are all things that we can make up when we come to it. Vault, slightly sunken, collapsed, crumbling, covered, nuisance of uh, uh, Medusa. So there's probably just one Medusa, really. I mean, uh, the way I run games anyways. Uh, villa, blah, blah, blah. So you can see them going down, and I have these different things. Now, if I used one, I might then go back, and what I would do is either I'd use it again if I felt like it was worthwhile, or I would change the monster, you know, and just keep the, the vague description, or I could just erase this whole thing and just make a new one. Right, uh, and they're going to encounter maybe one or two of this potential thing per session, so it's easy for me in between sessions. You know, spending the half a day when I first starting making all these lists, but once I've made them, it, after each session, if I spend like an hour, I can refresh everything. So it's pretty easy to just go back through and be like, okay, the vault they, they found, I like the idea of the vault, I have some more imagination that I could use that, but let's see, let's roll something different for the monsters. And then I roll and I get something different. Um, all right, so this could be our gargoyles. Uh, temples. I make a, a note. They could be abandoned, non-fighting priests, or a cult. And then I just basically have a description of it, right? Central plan, domed, 1d5 plus 3 sides, domed or vaulted center, primitive pyramid, right? So these are all... Oh, it's spelling issues there. I don't know what that word means. Uh, so basically, I these I'm going to make up each time, which means that I'm probably not going to refresh these because... Again, they're different. Uh, Pagoda, six sides, six sides, 1d10 plus one level. Maybe I'll change that to seven sides or ten sides or whatever if I decide later, right? I mean, it's it's kind of easy enough to change. But this is all this is all vague, so it can be used over and over again. Uh, cults. I've got sect, the covenant, following an elf female magic user at death. All clerics, shaved head, uh, shaved all hair from body. Union and oracle worship. Now, these you can make up or not. What I did do was I made, I think it's down here. It might not be in this document. Oh, no, yeah, here we go. I did make um, a cult. <laughs> um, just so I'd have one, you know, uh, if I needed it uh, in a pinch. It really kind of depends on how I wanted to play it. I, I was kind of thinking that if the players got involved with the cult, then I could flush it out as I went, as you know, uh, quickly. Um because I know a little things, right? Follow, like this one, let's say, League, the Eclipse, follow female human magic user, doing ma'am, sleep on bed of nails. You know, I could literally just, I just see the name of the female magic user, right? And I don't even need any powers for her because the way that I run monsters and NPCs and stuff is I don't generally use stats from the book for them. They're usually, um, I mean, I don't just make it up off the top of my head in the middle of a combat, clearly, but like, I will just, when they encounter her, depending on what I want it to be, it could be that she's a first level magic user, just has them all charmed, maybe, right? It could be that she's a high level magic user and has tons of power. It really depends on what I decide in that moment, and I can change it, right? Uh, this one, they worship a lich, committing genocide, dead members are desiccated, flesh. So this was really terrible, right? So this is basically depending, these are five cults, and I, th I believe that these I also got from this book. Let me check that out. There's cults in here. It doesn't feel like something I'd make up. Yeah, cult generator. Yeah, so this has the cults, the ruins, and the temples. Uh, it also has uh, magical places. It is, has pilgrims, it has roads. So you can, I mean, you can really go crazy with this D30 uh, generator. Now, then I also have a special, right, where they basically, it's either a hermit, a nomad camp, a trading post, abandoned fortress, military outpost, or abandoned temple. And, and now keep in mind that all of these have a single role, and the reason for that is that, um, well, maybe I used one of these, because look, it's uh, they only have five, so I wonder if I died, I was rolling on d5, I probably had six, and I probably used one, so I uh, 
I had deleted it and never replaced it. <laughs> um, but basically, the reason why um, why I keep these ones vague is because it really depends on what's going on. Like, maybe they need some, they're lost and they need some direction. The hermit, now they run into a hermit. Perfect. Nomad camp, obviously, is moving. Maybe they're short on supplies, right? And there's a trading post, so I can just manipulate it to be appropriate for them. Or they want to sell something, you know? So I can basically use these things. I mean, clearly, you can just pick, but I was doing it randomly because I feel like that's just a fun way to do it. Military outpost, you know, what What are they fighting for? What's going on, right? So you can get a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, and, of course, abandoned temple is just an abandoned temple. I would just use one of the other uh, temple uh, things here and just, you know, just like, again, just an abandoned temple. But because I rolled it on special, I might end up adding something extra to it, you know, depending on how I did it. Now, I did do this, by the way. I can't remember what vlog. If somebody's watching this and... Uh, and you know what blog this came from? Because I'm pretty sure I got this from a blog. This is now years ago. This idea, anyways, I think I changed it. But this is one of the most brilliant things that I've seen for, for hex crawls and for random stuff. So totally use this um, if you've never seen it before. But essentially, you make two tables. So I have a table uh, 2A and 2B, right? You roll twice on table A and once on table B. So for instance, you could get lepers traveling to see wizards, right? Or you could switch around. Wizard traveling to see leopard. You could do villagers uh, betraying a madman. Like what is that, right? <laughs> so like you literally create these um, these little pocket scenarios that that just happen kind of randomly. And again, all this stuff keeps you on your toes, but it's completely random. And these are great opportunities to add parts of the world that you want the PCs to know about, right? So if you're if you've got brigands traveling to see, uh, you know the Lord and retinue and you want to give that information about the Lord or, or whatever, or just the world in general, like why are brigands traveling to the Lord? If that's something that goes on, maybe the Lord is using them for a battle they're doing or some corruption going on. You can basically use all of that and like literally just stick it together. And it's really fun. Uh, I think the very first encounter that I, I did in the campaign, um, I, the first one that was random, cause I actually had like a little scripted part at the beginning cause I needed them to get the, the, the magic item that they needed to get. Um, but basically, uh, that was one of the first ones they encountered. I think it was something with lepers, and it was really fun. I mean, uh, it was it was actually a cool encounter. Now, I also have Signs of Destruction, which I cannot remember where I got this from. I definitely got this from some random table. This might have been from a Donjon, but basically, this is just crazy stuff. The wildlife has been, has been uh, muted and made insane. Things have turned inside out. The ground leaks strange blue-green fluids, and there are weird blackening tops of what were once trees. The plants themselves seem twisted, mutated, and unwholesome. There's a 70% chance of encountering a black pudding of some of the ooze-like monster. Like, there's 20 of these, and they're all nuts, you know? The still-living head of a spawn of Cthulhu has landed nearby. The fact is that some ancient god thing is looking to kill more of these spawns, and your party is in the way. So these really, I mean, if you roll this, things are happening, right? So, and again, they don't need to be that, right? They, like, they don't even have to, they could all just be like uh, burnt villages, they could be whatever, but they're signs that something went on. And I used them for this because I had this whole war thing going on, but, you know, again, you would put whatever you want here, but essentially what these are meant to be is, is outlayer kind of crazy things. And again, I made them all equally random, so I'll point that out. The only thing you have a better chance of encountering on my table is monsters. And part of that is because there's three kind of parts of the monster. Um, and also, you know, I just they're, I just like random monsters. But if you were doing this um, and you wanted, let's say, that destruction, you were like, okay, that's got to be really rare. What you could do is make the table a 2d6 table or a 3d6 table, right? And put the sign of destruction, let's say, at one of the outlayers. Like make it, let's say you're doing a 2d6, you could make a 12 or two signs of destruction because those are very rare. And if monsters are, are supposed to be more prominent, then they could be somewhere in the middle, like around your sevens and sixes. Uh, a good reference, if you're doing this, is to look at the uh, the reaction chart that's that you know that BX uses. If you're doing BX, it's a you know it's a, a two to twelve chart that gives you the nice little spread to use, uh, and you could break them down into those categories. That's the easy way to do it. Or of course, you could do the three uh, uh, D six if you have more stuff like I do here. So we're gonna what ends up happening here is. I should have got some dice so I could roll this up randomly. We'll just, we'll just pick. So right now we have our 
Now, the final thing here, okay, so we have that, is I have monsters. And again, this I got from the game science book. And what I did here was I wanted every monster that they encountered unless uh, to be unique. And because the book itself has a lot of weird old monsters, there's no regular monsters in that book. I mean, I guess the living statue is kind of regular, but, you know, most of the monsters are bizarre. Like there's one made out of, like, raspberries and stuff. Like, it's weird. Um, so I wanted every monster they hit to be unique. So what I did was I picked 10 monsters from the game science book, and I put them in on my chart. And then every time they encountered one, I, I when I was actually running this, uh, I had a couple extras down, just written down here. Um, I guess I'd used them all. I don't know why they're not here. Or maybe this is like another copy of it. But basically, I would have, let's say I had, I mean, it wouldn't be this, but let's say orcs, goblins, and werewolves. You know, you'd have those at the bottom, and then once you removed one of these, you would just put one of those up there so you can be prepared for it if you're going to have a lot of combats. Or you just leave it blank, um, you know, for that section and uh, use the use the thing that where they don't encounter them, they just see tracks. So let's say, for instance, there's a, a Bonacon, right? So you encounter the Bonacon, which I have no idea what Bonacon is. I would look it up. You encounter the Bonacon uh, early on, and then you roll the Bonacon again. What I would do as a GM there is I would just have tracks from it. You know, that's the easiest way to do that. Uh, here's the cult, like I said. I made that. This one I made using um, the general idea of the cults from here, and then I went in. I was using Wonders and Wickedness for the magic system. So um, that's why their spells are uh, are different here. Uh, and then I made a totally random thing. This one I got from Don John. This is like if I just need something random that I just want to like throw something in to mix it up. Or if they're asking somebody, like let's say they're looking for a rumor. What I would do is roll on the totally random chart where there's 20 things here. Let's say I rolled a, I don't know, let's say 14. Ancient structure, a construction of antiquity, a grave marker, astrological construction, pagan shrine, 10% chance that possesses magical properties. Okay, so I have that. So they're looking for rumors, and let's say I roll that, now I can have somebody give them a rumor about that, right? Obviously, they're going to say that it has magical properties, because there's a 10% chance, and I can roll to see what it is. Oh, there's a grave marker nearby that if you, uh, you know, uh, drop, put flowers on it or put a stone on the grave, you know, at, while the moon is full, uh, it grants you second sight, you know, whatever. That's like a rumor, right? And of course, if I say that to them, I'll make sure I mark it down so I know that is a rumor. And whether or not that's true, we'll deal with it, they go there, you know? So this is my 100% uh, random part. It's you never roll this unless I choose to. Uh, and that's why I just call it totally random. So going on that idea, right, um, that I was talking about earlier, let's change this one up a little bit. Let's say we wanted to sculpt this in a more kind of uh, fixed way. So let's. what I'm going to do here, so I will tell you this. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to do two things here. Before we do this, let's do this. Let's go... Um, Man, I want to get dice. All right, I'm going to get dice for a second. Okay, I'm getting up in the middle of the recording video. I'm back. <laughs> All right, let's roll dice. Let's make a day's worth of stuff, and let me show you how this would, would have worked. So I've got 3d8. Now, again, this is how I ended up doing it. Even though it says roll three times, blah, 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 what I, did, what I ended up changing it to was I rolled three dice all at once and I kind of combined them. What I did do is I did keep track of what was what order just in case. So I've got three dice. I'm just going to roll the first one, which is a three, and then a seven, and then a seven. Okay. So in theory, that's morning, uh, midday, and night. So the three is a trap, and the seven is location, table, table one. So before I do anything else, I'm going to go down to my locations, and I'm going to roll d d6. Yeah, D6. The first location is a small city. No, no, no. First location is empty ruins. And the second location is a four, which is ruins. Okay, so ruins loaded with stuff. So, so now I've got three things going on, right? So that ruins loaded with stuff. Let me actually roll that as well. I'm just using more dice so I can go back to it. A three, okay. So it's going to be a noticeably burned stride infested with satyrs. Oh, interesting. Okay. So now I've got a trap, right? Or or something to that, that effect. Trap hazard. Use for actual trap to fill up terrain, river crossing, cliff face, or clues, right? So what I might end up doing here is I might, let's say the party's traveling through, and even though that's the first thing they're supposed to find, I'm going to take the one that I rolled in the middle, which is the... Uh, the uh, the, the ancient ruins that are empty, 
and I'm going to have them find that first, right? So they're going to be traveling, and they they come upon some ruins. Maybe they search around a little bit, we play it out, you know, whatever. Um, and I'm going to use a similar description um, to the next one that I'm going to use. And the reason for that is I'm going to have them find this this uh, temple that's noticeably burned and destroyed, right? They're going to be looking for clues. They're going to be trying to figure out what's going on. And then at some point, somebody's going to find either uh, trails, you know, maybe leading off, or depending on how deep they are in the campaign, uh, they might find uh, like totems from a tribe. Like let's say they know that satyrs leave certain totems. I might leave that there so they know it's the, the satyrs. Um, or perhaps I'm going to, um, you know, literally just leave footprints where they could walk footprints in the case of satyrs. So it's like, so they don't, so there's not like necessarily a trail. There's, um, you know, they see one ruined thing. They see some satyr foot footprints or they see literally a trail leading from this to another, you know, crunk, crunk, crunched grass, you know, trees being uh, broken branches, etc. Um, or, or like I say, they see signs, like maybe there's graffiti, um, you know, stuff like that. That then leads them, um, you know, so that's that's my second thing, right? So that then leads them to the, the last ruin where the satyrs are going to be. And what I might end up doing too is I might like look at this as a more of a wide scope and be like, okay, there's going to be a trail, but the trail is going to have some kind of alarm or trap so that when they get to the other ruin, the satyrs are there. Or more likely, and this is what's working in my head right now, is that the they find this first ruin, they're exploring it, you know, it's kind of burnt and charred, so they, they have that smoky smell, so maybe they're not super aware or whatever. And then at some point, somebody's looking around, and they look up, and they see smoke coming from a, a, a distance away. So now they have to decide, right? Do they want to, and then of course they look around and they see that there's like trail heading off that way. Do they want to um, go pursue what's going on there to stop these people that are burning, to investigate what's going on? Or wait, maybe they'll wait and see, let them destroy it and then go go check after, right? All of this is going to be decisions that the PCs can make. And then if the if the, the satyrs are actually doing it to attract people, then I'll put some kind of a trap on the way. If not, I won't, you know, uh, easy enough. When they get to the final ruin, that's where the satyrs are. They're either, you know, drunken, so they're they're like still hanging out there after trashing the place, or you know, they're they're like peeing on the walls and, and defacing it um, and burning it, and you know, going on about that. Or maybe they're already done. They're like exhausted because they did that, and they're they're, you know, parted out and they're drinking. And when the party shows up, they're just like, "Hey, join us! Help us destroy this temple and drink with us." You know, it's all how you want to play the satyrs, how it's going to play out in the game, how the different uh, PCs are. It really depends on your campaign, how you want to do it. But that's how you can produce, you know, something from the three rolls pretty easily. I just shifted them a little bit, you know, you know, to be pretty easy to, to make to make it work out so that it actually made a bit of a story. But let's let's do this, though, instead. Let's just because now I'm curious. Let's say that you have an idea for your adventure, like it's more of a. Uh, sandbox around like a normal campaign. It's not like a random -y thing that I was doing. What we can do here is we can change these numbers to make it flow out better in a in a more um, you know more random way. So we know that three and twelve are going to be. Well, I'm sorry, two and twelve. We're going to do it. Uh, actually, I'll do three and eighteen. And we'll base these on uh, ability scores. Let Let's do it like the BX does about does ability scores. So let's go to. Uh, yeah, let's go here. Oh, there we go. Let's open up my BX book and let's look at ability scores. Let's go look at the range. Three to five, six to eight. I'm just looking how many of these things I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. All right, I only have five here, but I'm going to make three and 18. Oh, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, I have the seven. Perfect. All right, so three. Three is one of them, and then four to five. And then we've got six to eight. And then we've got nine to 12, which of course is the most common thing. 13 to 15. Then we've got 16, 17, and then we have 18. So I'm gonna take the things that are the least common and I'm gonna put them in the first uh, the first ones. I'm gonna say that the, the let's say that the key location is the most. Well, it really depends on the Hescrawler you're running, right? 
maybe the key location is not that uncommon. So let's say that um, weather is uncommon. Like you, you're, it's in a place where the weather is pretty consistent. So, and your weather events are then, now if I did this, then I'm making my weather events some kind of extreme weather. Maybe in this world, when it rains, uh, it's like acid rain and like burns the skin. So if a weather event happens, it's dangerous, right? It's something weird going on. Uh, I'm going to make my, um, my signs of destruction 18, because again, that's pretty rare. And then we'll just go through this. Let's say that, let's say that, it, what I, let's say I want them to encounter each, each special thing. I know I'm calling it special, but you know, it's a module. I want to, those are the things I want them to encounter. I'll put that right in the middle. So in almost every case, they're going to find the thing that's in the, that's in the hex that they're looking for. Right. Um, and then we can say, uh, to run to pilgrims is also fairly common. To run into monsters is also fairly common. And let's see. And then we make the other ones less common locations. And traps. Okay, so we do this, right? Um, now we have a range that's a little bit more... Um, you know, more spread out so that we know that like most times that we roll, we're going to end up with a, actually let's do it. I mean, I'm just gonna do it once, which doesn't prove anything, but let's just see what happens if we, if I run with the exact same thing. Uh, all right, so the first first time is a nine. So that's a special. The second time is, is a, a 13, which is Pilgrims. And then I've got an 11, which is the key task hex again. And so the problem with it being that being the center, see, I've just realized this, is that if there's only one special, it can't be the main thing because then they'll just run into that unless you want them to go around circles. So maybe what we'll do instead is make just locations in general, you know, like random locations, since that's a big chart of different things, the most common thing. So now instead they've they've got two locations in pilgrims, right? And that's basically how we could do it. And I would definitely recommend doing that, like play play it around a little bit. Um, I mean, I probably wouldn't make weather event that. Uh, well, again, I'd make it some, something special. I would add a chart for weather events that's more extreme because I mean, honestly, if the weather event is is that rare, it should be something important. Or it could be there in the desert or something, and it's just not that common that some the weather changes. And when it does. Yeah, you know, it's a sandstorm or something like that. So again, you can make that whatever you want it to be. And that can be just another, it's easy enough to make a table, you know. You can make a, a you know, a weather table. So the, our weather could be, let's see, uh, hail. Did I just spell hail? Or is that not the right spelling of hail? Yeah, pellets frozen. Okay, I thought so. It's funny when the same word means multiple things. Hailstones, uh, acid rain. Um, let's see, it's a uh, dense fog and uh, terrible winds. And we'll do winds slash rain, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then we'll do um, no we'll do thunderstorms. Right, so now we can just do that. Right, and again, if you want these to be more actually, let's do it this way. Um, Two, and then we got three to five, six to eight, nine to eleven, and twelve. Now we don't need that extra one. <laughs> I was really reaching with that one. I know, and then again, we can change it depending on on what we're gonna do. Maybe this place, uh, you know, has the winds, winds, and, winds and rain is common uh, terrible winds though you know meaning damaging winds are the least common so that's maybe we'll maybe we'll change that to tornado 
Oh, this place is scary. Um, and we'll change the little fog here. And no, it feels like that shouldn't be. Like the fog is not so bad. See what's happening here? Like I only have really bad weather here. So you didn't need to make the fog worse. Um, poison fog. So it's poisonous fog. When they got to get out of that fog, or else uh, if they don't, then they are going to uh, you know suffer some kind of damage, or probably a con, or, or you know, it really depends on the game you're playing. But now we're looking at. You know, if they roll that, I mean, they might just, the most common thing that's going to happen is it's going to just, winds and rain are going to pick up. Uh, if they get an IR-12, there's going to be some kind of poison fog. We'll say uh, drains con. And, uh, you know, acid rain will, will obviously uh, ruins gear. And we'll say hailstones do damage. Uh, winds and rain is just going to slow movement. All right, so they all have an effect. And tornado is going to be damage slash uh, destroy damage or destroy gear. I'll make it either or because depending on how the, the the weather happens, right? So now we've got this like crazy weather that can happen. Um, we've got, um, and again, it's it's it, that makes it more more sense for it to be there. In fact, I still think it's probably two, for it to be a one that's not nearly as dangerous as it should be. So, we'll uh, maybe I should make them all dangerous. But then again, maybe that is dangerous depending on what's going on, right? It really just comes down to um, your setting. But I guess my point here is that the trick to this kind of thing is to do a little bit of prep ahead of time. And then when you play through it, every time you go through, and let's say you encounter something, you just make a little change. So um, let's say that we've got, we encounter this hut with the, with the cockatrice. If I use the same book I used to make it, Runes Generator, 19. So if I look at this book, it actually has a um, suggested inhabitants. Um, and I can just roll on that. It's a D10, and then there's a... Uh, it just says dot, dot, dot. I guess there's like 15 things here. Or no, there's uh, two... There's two through 12, so it's 10. Oh, 10, okay. Um, yeah, let's roll two sentai dice. So, let's say we're gonna, we're gonna go with that. Let's bust out two 10-sided dice. So these two. We got a one and a three. Well, one is uh, Chimeras again, and the three is Minotaur. So now, the next time that they encounter, you know, a hut that's slightly sunken and collapsed, it's actually a Minotaur, you know? So there you go. So, that, you know, that changes it up a little bit. And again, you could change the whole rune if you want. You can change any part of it. That's actually kind of your um, your options here. And then what I would do for sure, like actually looking at this now, like I feel like it's weird that Abandoned Temple is here. So I may actually change this um, to something else. Let's say this is going to be a witch. You know, witches are always good. And again, I'm making it random. You, what you can do, you know, completely random, but it's easy enough for you to make these, you know, again, have the flow. Uh, again, using the 3 to 18 or using the... Um, the the two the, the, the two to twelve you can make any range you want I guess um, but of course if you make each thing an even number then it becomes equally uh, the same that you're going to encounter one or the other that's basically what you're looking at there so there you go I hopeful hopefully that was helpful guys um, this is essentially you know a, a way to play you know so when you're when somebody says hey you know uh, we would love to well, play in a sandbox, you know, and you're like a GM and you're just like, oh, I'm not sure what to do. You can actually make it pretty, uh, start off pretty small, uh, make a handful of tables. Like, you know, what I have here, um, monster, some kind of a hazard, like natural hazard, uh, special, which would be something that's in the location and key. You don't even need that. You can, if you don't want to have some in the location, 
a sign of destruction I always think is good because that kind of gives you an idea of what it might be. Um, weather event is always a good thing to happen. Uh, encountering a location and encountering some kind of like NPCs that aren't necessarily hostile. Now, if you don't want to make a signs of destruction table like I did, what you could do is just roll on your random monster chart when you get that one and see what it is. So let's say that you get, you know, orcs for the uh, for the random monster, then you might be like, well, you know what, orcs are were they're building up uh, some some war machines, so they're chopping down trees. So the signs of destruction that you get is there's it's basically been forested, but in like a messy way, and there's no like roads and stuff, so it's more like like something came in here and knocked down a whole bunch of trees and chopped them down and left it really messy. Uh, you know, that's your sign of destruction. Or maybe it's a, 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 you know, it could be anything. It could be a, an avalanche. It could be, you know, a, a a meteor may have fallen from the sky. I mean, it could be anything, right? You can put any kind of sign of destruction that works with your world. And I think that's a good thing to have because what you want to do is when you're running a sandbox, you really want to put out a lot of questions out there in the world so that the PCs are constantly asking questions and you don't necessarily have to have all the answers. I think that's really the trick to it. You just put the questions out there and once they're out there and minds start working, you can develop it. You don't need to think about every little thing like, okay, why is this tree's cut down? What's going on here? You don't need to think about it until they encounter it. Or as the world's building up and you start to encounter certain things, and let's say they encounter these people that are like, uh, you know, illegally foresting, I don't know that's like on my mind, um, then when that comes up, you could be like, okay, well, we already know that ties into the setting somewhere. So maybe they see signs of this group that's been doing this, and you know you can get a reward from the Duke if you bring them into justice because they're, they're foresting when they're not supposed to, right? So this all ties into setting um, and how you can work it. So hopefully that was helpful, guys. I, I think my, my plan is to use the expert rules to build a little area because they, they have like a whole thing in there of how to build like a random area. So uh, I'm going to actually do that. This was how I did it for an actual, uh, you know, game that I ran, uh, not using any kind of rules specifically. I just kind of did it and just stuff I found online. Um, but I'm going to use the actual expert rules in the future, probably not next week, but uh, when I have a chance. So we'll see how that kind of measures up and how that works. So, you know, hopefully uh, this has good, been good information, guys. Let me know if there's something else you want to see or discuss. Um, I'm going to work on a video on the thief, like how what I like about the thief and how to use it and stuff. It's just that a lot of this stuff has been said a million times, so I want to make sure that I can add something to the conversation. In any case, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.